Hello, welcome to this video about the poem Checking Out Me History by John Agard. I'm Miss Kilburn Bond. What I'm hoping to do through this video is help you to read and understand the events, the themes and the tone of the poem Checking Out Me History by John Agard and that will enable you to show, if you're writing about this poem in an exam, assessment objective one, so that ability to be able to see the overview of what this poem is trying to say. Then for assessment objective two, I'm hoping to help you explore and analyse the effect of some of the language, the form, the structure of the poem and how that creates meaning. And then finally, for assessment objective three, to appreciate how the poem's context helps us understand its meaning. So that's both looking at the poet and the time it was written in and thinking about some of the events and people that are mentioned and how that helps us understand the poet's motivation. And what you can see on the screen now are a range of photographs from events in history. Why I'm asking you to look at these is because the concept of history and what history means to us is really central to understanding this poem by John Agard. Now, if you look at each photograph, think about what is happening in that photograph. They're all historical events that I think you will be able to relate to. And what I want you to think about is whether you feel that these events have shaped the person that you are today? How might your life be different without these events? How might knowing about these events shape the way that you approach your life? So I'll just give you a minute or pause the video and just have a think about what kinds of things you learn from history and how they make you feel like the person you are. How important is history to how you feel about your own identity? And keeping with that historical theme, if you like, let's have a look at the context, the history surrounding the poet and the ideas in this poem. So John Agard was born in British Guyana in the Caribbean in 1949. So he was born and he grew up there. Then he moved to the UK in the late 1970s. And one of the things that he's achieved through his writing is that he educates people about Caribbean culture. A lot of his poems explore the idea of his identity as someone who grew up in the Caribbean. He's well known for his powerful and entertaining performances of his work as he believes in the power of the spoken word and that's also important to understanding the way in which this poem is written. He's a performance poet so in some ways he probably wouldn't be too pleased to think about you sitting down in an exam writing and analysing the poem as silent on the page because he believes that poetry is most powerful when it's performed to an audience and people are listening to it. And what we'll be doing is thinking about how that translates through the poem. So linked to that idea, he's understandably hugely proud of his cultural background and identity. And so what he does is through his writing, he uses his own Caribbean dialect, so his style of speaking, which we call Creole. And that gives his poems full expression to the voice of his homeland. And when you hear him perform, when you read his words on the page, it's really clear that his voice comes from a history as someone who grew up in British Guyana and uses that Creole dialect. Now, British Guyana was one of Britain's colonies, so if you're not familiar with the British colonial history and what a colony means, that's something you're going to need to do some research on in order to really understand the poem. So there was a time where British Guyana was then ruled by the British, and when John Agard went to school, he would have been given an education that was essentially British, even though he lived in the Caribbean. And that, and the conflict that that creates, is at the centre of this poem. So before we look at the poem, there are just some key references that you need to be familiar with. So if you haven't already got your copy of the poem in front of you with some highlighters and pencils and things, do so now. Quickly pause the video and run and get those. Because one of the things I think would help you to do first is just to go through your copy of the poem, finding this list of references and making sure that you've got a little note to remind you who they are and why they're important. So we've got Toussaint L'Ouverture, a ruler who led the slaves to victory in the Haitian Revolution. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the poem. We've got Nanny de Maroon, the leader of the Maroons, a group of runaway slaves. She led Jamaican resistance against the British. We've got Lord Nelson, 
an officer in the Royal Navy who died during the Battle of Trafalgar, so seen as a kind of heroic figure, a great naval officer for the British. We've got Shaka, an influential Zulu leader and warrior in Africa. We've got the Caribs and the Arawaks. They're Caribbean people whose islands were invaded by Europeans. And then finally, we've got a reference to Mary Seacole, who was a Jamaican nurse who helped the sick in the Crimean War. And all of those people, if you want to read more about them, there's plenty of information online to help you research them further. But just to understand the poem, then those summaries are enough for you to get a sense of what John Agard wants his poem to tell us. And I'm going to let John Agard read the poem to you because as a performance poet, I think that he does something with a poem that I just couldn't recreate. So enjoy listening to the poem, have it in front of you. And after you've heard him read it, pause the video and then read it yourself a couple of times because every time you read the poem, the meaning and the themes and all those ideas are going to settle a little bit more for you. Checking out me history. Dem tell me, dem tell me what dem want for tell me. Bandage up me eye with me own history. Blind me to me own identity. Dem tell me about 1066 and all that. Dem tell me about Dick Whittington and he cat. But to St. Louis, what you know, dem never tell me about that. Toussaint, a slave with vision, lick back, Napoleon, battalion, and first black republic, born Toussaint, the thorn to the French, Toussaint, the beacon of the Haitian revolution. Them tell me about the man who discovered the balloon and the cow jump over the moon. Them tell me about the dish, run away with the spoon, but them never tell me about Nanny the maroon. Nanny, Sifar, woman of mountain, dream, fire woman, struggle, hopeful, stream to freedom, river. Them tell me about Lord Nelson and Waterloo, but them never tell me about Shaga the Great Zulu. Them tell me about Columbus and 1492, but what happened to the Carib and the Arawak too? Them tell me about Florence Nightingale and she lamp, and how Robin Hood used to camp. Them tell me old King Cole was a merry old soul, but them never tell me about Mary C. Cole. From Jamaica, she traveled far to the Crimean War. She volunteered to go even when the British said no. She braved the Russian snow, a healing star among the wounded. A yellow sunrise among the dying. Them tell me, them tell me what them want for tell me. But now I checking out me history. I carving out me identity. Okay, so hopefully that reading brought the poem to life. Let's now start going through it and thinking about how we can analyse some of the key ideas. So checking out me history by John Agard. This poem is a monologue, a dramatic monologue. So we've got an implied narrator who is living under British colonial rule, who's telling us the story of the poem, if you like. It's written in free verse. What that means is there's no set structure in terms of rhyme and rhythm. Sometimes there are some rhyming quatrains, so they are four line stanzas. And whenever there's a rhyming quatrain, it's the bits of the poem about the British education system. And that's quite interesting because the British education system would be quite formal and those are the points in the poem where John Agar tends to use any kind of structure. He then, when he comes into the bits where he's celebrating his own Afro-Caribbean history, he doesn't stick to any of those rules. He uses lots of enjambement, lots of internal rhyme schemes and that creates this sense of being colloquial and rebellious creating a really distinctly different voice from the British colonisers to those people who represent his own culture. It's a really clever idea about the structure and the form of the poem that you could talk about there. We've talked about the fact that John Agard himself grew up in British Guyana, so he has his own life experience of living in a British colony and what that meant for his education system. Although 
the narrator in this poem doesn't necessarily have to be him. It's someone who represents anyone from any country that has lived under that colonial rule. The poem was first published in 2005. It was published in a collection called Half Cast. Half Cast itself is another really good poem that you might want to go away and read with lots of similar themes and ideas. And we just have a sentence that sort of sums up what this poem's generally about. It's focusing on holes in the British colonial education system and how, in Agard's opinion and experience, there was an omission of African, Caribbean and indigenous history. And he is resentful of that. He is rebelling against it. He's protesting about the way in which he was taught. OK, so let's have a look then at the start of this poem. Dem tell me, dem tell me, or dem want to tell me. We've got immediate repetition here. Repetition emphasising the anger that this narrator is immediately introducing to us. So, dem tell me, dem tell me. We've also got that Creole dialect, so dem meaning them, and that is immediately creating a sense of otherness, the other person, the other group of people. So, what John Agar's doing is setting up an opposition between me and them, me being the narrator of our poem. So we've got this immediate sense of conflict happening. Dem tell me, dem tell me, what dem want to tell me. And we also immediately get this idea that the narrator has been controlled, is not getting the whole story from them, from these other people, who we realise quite quickly represent the British colonial education system. Dem tell me, dem tell me what dem want to tell me. Bandage up me eye with me own history. Blind me to my own identity. There's some really powerful imagery here that we need to spend a bit of time on. So let's look first of all at this word bandage. We might usually see and think about the word bandage in relation to being used for healing, for making people better. But in this context, it's actually being used quite aggressively. The word bandage is actually about the British denying the narrator vision, denying light, putting this person in the dark from their own history. So British colonial education becomes the oppressor. It's really oppressive. And what John Agard's doing is suggesting that it's deliberately blinding colonised people to their own history and therefore to their own sense of identity. And that's what makes him really angry. We're straight into the frustration in this poem with that image. And you know, metaphorically, we then have a second image that's very similar. Blind me to my own identity. Now, education should enlighten. That's what you know, people believe education is about. It should be enlightening. It should be giving hope and options and vision. But actually, in this case, it's leading to blindness. It's blinding, deliberately stopping him from seeing his own identity, from getting a sense of who he is and what his own cultural history, how that's panned out to enable him to be the person he is today. And then we move into the history references in the poem. Dem tell me about 1066 and all that. Dem tell me about Dick Whittington and the cat. Now, we've got the repetition again of the dem tell me that's used throughout the poem. We're going to keep coming back to that repetition because it's constantly reminding us of this conflict between them and us. And then we have a reference to 1066, so the Battle of Hastings, so a key historical moment in British history that's often taught in schools. And then we have this link to Dick Whittington and his cat, which is often the subject of pantomime, a British folklore story. So he's deliberately making fun of the things that the British colonial education system thought were important because they were teaching the Battle of Hastings that had nothing to do with the Caribbean. They were teaching Dick Whittington this cat, which is just an English folklore story. But what they weren't teaching, and notice that word, but they weren't teaching about really inspirational figures who came from John Agard's culture, who were relevant to his sense of identity. So, but Toussaint L'Overture, no, dem never tell me about that. So what we now find in the poem is that John Agard is going to educate us about this person from his culture who he thinks should have been given the time. And this 
all the way through the poem we have this juxtaposition, this putting two different things together. So we've got the Eurocentric history, some of it's even frivolous like Dick Whittington, that's put up against, so versus, these powerful African, Caribbean and indigenous figures and that's what we're about to see now. So we've had 1066 and Dick Whittington now put up against in conflict with Toussaint L'Ouverture and how important he is to history. So even visually on the page, the use of italics and the way in which the stanza is set out creates this distinctive, different voice from the voice that's talking about what happened with the British colonisers. And all of this is giving power to his own culture. Toussaint, a slave with vision, lick back Napoleon battalion and first black republic born, Toussaint de Thorn to the French, Toussaint de Beacon of the Haitian Revolution. So let's have a look at some of the important things that we can see here. Now, there's a lot of repetition in this, particularly of the name Toussaint, which gives the name power through that repetition. It also adds a chanting quality to this part of the poem, which is all part of this giving his own culture the power in terms of the sound of this poem. So Toussaint's a visionary, someone who rose up from slavery, who fought back Napoleon's army to gain that Haitian independence from the French. So it was also therefore the first black democracy in the Americas, it was the first colony to ever overthrow a European colonial power and it was also the first to abolish slavery. You know, there are so many reasons why this would seem to be a hugely important part of the history of the Caribbean and yet it was totally ignored by that British education system. But through this chanting stanza, through the repetition of his name, through the figurative language linked to vision, so talking about a slave with vision, Toussaint de Beacon, words that all connote light and vision, we get this sense that this is where we're going to find hope and inspiration in the poem. The way to understand identity is to go to these beacons of light who are shining in the darkness of colonial history. Toussaint de Beacon, a beacon being a fire or a light used as a signal, he is used in the poem as a source of hope and of inspiration to others. Dem tell me about the man who discovered a balloon and the cow who jump over the moon. Dem tell me about the dish run away with the spoon. But dem never tell me about Nanny de Maroon. So we're back to one of the quatrains here, the rhyming quatrain where we're looking at the British education system and the things that he was taught as a child. We've got the repetition again of dem tell me, dem tell me perhaps reflecting a repetitive lecturing teacher who keeps saying the same thing over and over again, but definitely emphasising this sense of bitterness, the relentless, controlling nature of his education that he wants to rebel against. And again, we've got the juxtaposition, the imbalance of the stories that the British taught, a lot of which are very childlike and frivolous, silly, put up against the bravery and the courage and the leadership of figures from his own culture. So we have the cow jumped over the moon, the dish running away with the spoon. We've got a nursery rhyme that doesn't seem to have any real significance in terms of studying history put up against this character, Nanny de Maroon, another visionary known for escaping slavery, founding a town where other escaped slaves could go in the Jamaican mountains. So someone who had a huge impact on many people linked to John Agar's Caribbean history. Nanny, seafar woman of mountain dream, fire woman struggle, hopeful stream to freedom river. So again, we've got the change in the sense of the rhythmic, the lyrical imagery in this part of the poem. We've got the italics again to show that we're being given this very distinct voice to set the people from his cultural history apart from what he was taught. And look for that symbolism of light again. So Nanny is a seafar woman. She's a visionary. She could see a better future. She could see a way to make a difference. She's a fire woman, also linked to the idea of power and strength and light. And she's metaphorically linked to this idea of the hopeful stream to the freedom river. She could see a journey which would take people to freedom. And she's linked to that natural imagery. We've got mountains and fire and streams and river. So there's something beautiful about her role 
in history, something linked to the natural world. Absolutely in contrast to talking about a cow jumping over the moon and a dish running away with a spoon. So the pattern that we've been talking about continue again here. Dem tell me about Lord Nelson and Waterloo, but dem never tell me about Shaka, the great Zulu. Dem tell me about Columbus in 1492, but what happened to the Caribs and the Arawaks too? So let's just have a little look at that bit there. We've got Lord Nelson, so the British naval officer who's seen as being particularly heroic, and um, Waterloo, which was the end of the Napoleonic Wars and a victory for the British. So we've got this important historical moment for British culture, but Dem never tell me about Shaka, the great Zulu, now, an important Zulu king, the monarch in Africa, who interestingly never made contact with any Europeans so has been totally dismissed by the British colonial powers as being anything that should be taught as part of Afro-Caribbean history. Then tell me about Columbus in 1492 so the explorations and discoveries of Columbus and how that links to colonial history but and notice that word but again, what happened to the Caribs and the Arawaks too. This is neglected history, the, the whitewashing, you might hear it referred to as, of history, where the lessons didn't ever explore how most of those indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, once Columbus arrived, were mostly killed or displaced. So absolutely inequality in terms of how that history has been presented to the people living in the affected colonial areas in the Caribbean. Dem tell me about Florence Nightingale and she lamp and how Robin Hood used to camp. Dem tell me about old King Cole was a merry old soul but dem never tell me about Mary Seacole. So another rhyming quatrain here, another set of these four lines with that clear sense of the rhyme scheme. You can hear it through lamp and camp and soul and seacole. So we're still in the section where he's talking about what he was taught at school. Dem tell me, so that repetition again, the them and us, about Florence Nightingale and she lamp. So Florence Nightingale, famous English nurse who during the Caribbean War was pictured often in paintings and things holding a lamp where she was caring for injured soldiers, wounded soldiers in the dark. She was also a social reformer. You know, it deserves a place in history as someone who we study. She's put then against Robin Hood, who used to camp, a mythological figure. And again, this comic contrast of dignified, respected people from history and then the juxtaposition with the silly things that he was taught at school that don't really seem to have been that important, like the mythological figure of Robin Hood, like old King Cole as a merry old soul from the nursery rhyme. But Dem never tell me about Mary Seacole. Now, before we look at this section where we look in detail at Mary Seacole, Florence Nightingale was our last serious reference from British history. Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole very similar in terms of their roles, and yet Florence Nightingale, the British representative, was taught a lot through history. Mary Seacole had traditionally been ignored. So really clever link that John Agard makes there. So we're back to our musical section. Now we've got the italics to make it visually look different. We've got this sort of untraditional sense of the rhythm that gives this really distinct, beautiful lyrical voice to these sections about Caribbean history. From Jamaica, she travelled far to the Crimean War. So this is Mary Seacole, who was denied the chance to be a nursing volunteer by the British War Office. Really interesting story, definitely worth looking her up and reading a bit more about her. She volunteered, she wanted to go and help. She was inspired by Florence Nightingale, but the British War Office wouldn't let her go. But determined not to be put off, she then travelled independently on a very difficult journey to Russia, where she then did help heal wounded troops in a similar way to Florence Nightingale, yet was never given that role in British colonial history lessons. So, from Jamaica, she travelled far to the Crimean War. She volunteered to go, and even when the British said no, she still braved the Russian snow, a healing star. Hopefully you've noticed before I've even said it that we've got this idea of her being visionary again, a healing star, a light in the darkness, and this keeps being repeated. A healing star among the wounded, 
a yellow sunrise to the dying. And again, the yellow sunrise has got that clear link to vision and light. So she's an inspirational figure. She's linked to the dawn of a new day, the yellow sunrise. Everything about Mary Seacole is a symbol of hope. We can also look at the idea that she's a healing star, perhaps as a clever imagery link to Florence Nightingale carrying her lamp. And this brings us to the end of the poem. So again, we go back to this repetition and we go back actually to the very beginning of the poem. Dem tell me, dem tell me what dem want to tell me. So we've got that absolute repetition of all that anger from the beginning. But now the introduction of the conjunction but totally changes the trajectory, the direction of the poem. It's defiant, but now, so we've got this defiance after the repetition, but now something's going to change. But now I checking out my own history, and there's the title from the poem. So the title now takes on more significance. The title's actually the conclusion to the poem, and that's a very powerful message about taking control back about breaking for freedom, about being revolutionary, about wanting things to change. But now I checking out my own history. This narrator is not going to settle for the history they've been taught. They're finding out about their own historical stories that relate to their culture and they're being empowered by doing so. They are no longer going to be oppressed. So it's a rebellious poem, it's a protest poem with a conclusion that's encouraging other people to take control of your identity, to find out the stories that influence your own identity, to carve out your identity. Carving being an interesting verb there, it's an act of permanence. It can be a work of art if you're carving something, you're changing something and shaping it. And this all links to this idea of the visionaries he's talked about. You're making a break for freedom. You are accepting that you can make changes. You can carve out your own future and celebrate who you are and the stories that have brought you there. So let's hear some of those ideas summarised by the poet himself. The first line in our history book, I seem to remember, was West Indian history begins in 1492 with the arrival of Columbus. It's that very Eurocentric view. Nothing exists until the European has entered the arena. The retelling of history Depends a lot on who's telling the story. Dem tell me, dem tell me, what they want to tell me. Bandage up me eye with my own history. Blind me to my own identity. Dem tell me about 1066 and all that. Them tell me about Dick Whittington and he cat. But to St. Lou, but you know, them never tell me about that. I would like to think that the poem has a celebratory side. It's celebrating characters such as to St. Louverture or Mary Seacole or the Amerindian past. But in a poem, you're not writing a history book. You're not writing a piece of journalism. So no matter how well-intentioned you might be, or how crucial the facts might be, that wouldn't make a poem. So it came out in that way, like a counterpoint of two voices. So one voice is the nursery rhymes, counterpointed by a celebration of historical characters. Them tell me about the man who discovered the balloon and the cow jump over the moon. Them tell me the dish run away with the spoon but them never tell me about Nanny the maroon. When I think of Nanny, I'm thinking of like you're casting a spell. So I think from those words you get the feeling oh, how can I deliver this? This is a woman who use the traditions of our African ancestry. So that becomes a kind of a spell against 
an oppressive um, regime at the time. Nanny, seafar woman of mountain dream, fire woman, struggle, hopeful stream to freedom river. You can write a poem in Creole, but it might be a very reactionary poem. It might be very sexist. So it doesn't mean that writing a poem in Creole automa automatically means you write on. But you're using all of your registers of speech, your linguistic heritage, and it gives a pride simultaneously in language, but also in history. Them tell me about Lord Nelson and Waterloo But them never tell me about Shaga the Great Zulu Them tell me about Columbus and 1492 But what happened to the Carib and the Arawak too? Let's say I'm playing with words the way you might play with musical notes so a text becomes like a musical score and sometimes the voice of delivery doesn't show itself until after the poem is written. Them tell me about Florence Nightingale and she lamp and how Robin Hood used to camp. Them tell me old King Cole was a merry old soul but them never tell me about Mary C. Cole. The poet hopefully keeps us in touch with the vulnerable core of language that makes you what you are. It keeps you in touch with the heartfelt and vulnerable, fragile, complex, contradictory nature of the human beast. Them tell me, them tell me what they want to tell me. But now I checking out my own history. I carving out my identity. So you know by now that in the exam, as well as being able to talk about a poem, to explore and analyse it, you'd need to be able to make comparative links to other poems from the anthology. And there are plenty of poems that you'd be able to find ways of linking to. This is just a selection of ideas to help you when you're preparing and revising. So let's look first of all at Ozymandias by Shelley. Both poets explore themes of arrogance and conclude that an abuse of power doesn't have to be permanent, that actually power and control can be repossessed. They've both got that sort of revolutionary feel. London, Blake, in both poems the narrators are bitter, there's that angry tone that's aimed at those who've abused power, who've tried to control people, who've created inequality and treated people badly. So that's a really interesting comparison between those two. My Last Duchess by Browning, both portray the arrogance and the use of power to manipulate through storytelling. In charge of the Light Brigade, Tennyson, whilst they are very different in tone, both poets are determined to celebrate the stories of people they admire and believe should be remembered. So it's quite an interesting, sort of unusual way into a comparison, but that could definitely work. And then in The Emigre by Rumens, both poets celebrate cultural identity and that there is power in claiming your identity against oppressors. So that's quite a strong link that you could make between those two poems. And that brings us to the end of this video about checking out my history by John Agar. Thanks for listening. I hope that now you feel that you've got a good understanding of the events, the themes, the tone of the poem, that you could pick out and explore and analyse some of the language, the form, the structure of the poem. And finally, that the context that surrounds the poem, you've got some ideas about how that feeds into its overall themes. Thanks for listening. Bye.